Um, today, I'm very happy to have Aiden Bullich as our speaker for today. Aiden's a staff scientist and principal investigator at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and an adjunct assistant professor at UC Berkeley. His research interests include parallel computing, combinatorial scientific computing, high performance graph processing, machine learning sparse matrix computations, and computational biology. He was previously a Luis W. Alvarez postdoctoral fellow at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and a visiting scientist at the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. Um, he received his PhD from UC Santa Barbara and his bachelor's degree uh, from Sabanchi University in Turkey. Um, Idens received the DOE Early Career Award and the IEEE TCSE Award for Excellence for Early Career Researchers uh, for his contributions in research. And he's also a founding associate editor of the ACM Transactions on Parallel Computing. And today, Aiden's going to tell us about some of his recent work on sparse matrices and their applications in graphs, biology, and machine learning. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Aiden. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Julian. And uh, thanks for inviting me and having me here, um, Sananar. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about sparse matrices, which, uh, for those of you who are old enough, to know the history of scientific computing until about 10 to 15 years ago were exclusively used uh, to solve systems of equations, mostly systems of sparse linear equations. And hopefully my talk will convince you that the machinery that's been developed for decades can be used for problems beyond their initial intention, which I call them solvers in quotations. In particular, I'm gonna start with graphs, then I'm gonna move on to um, a little bit of uh, space between graphs and machine learning, and then I'll expand to a space that I think one of the only few applications I find that is in the intersection of graphs, biology, and machine learning, and I'll conclude with uh, a biological application of sparse matrix machinery. Um, so one of the um, earliest codes that I found about sparse matrices, actually my advisor found it a long time ago, is, um, is due to Harry Markowitz, it's a Nobel laureate, um, and he basically says, if you um, solve a system of linear equations, you can, if you're clever, you can actually keep things sparse. That's obviously he's referring to the Gaussian elimination case and the scientific computing application. Um, what we want to do is, you know, this machinery goes back to 70 years ago. Uh, so this is the work he has done in 1950s. Can we use the same technology for other problems? So here's one example that I um, really like to start. Imagine you would like to do uh, a breadth first traversal on a graph um, and you want to do it um, from multiple source vertices. In this example, I'm having a green vertex one, a red vertex four, and I believe a dark blue vertex three. And all I need to do to get my one half neighbors independently for each one of these starting points is to multiply the sparse adjacency matrix, in fact, this transpose um, with an indicator um, matrix where each column represents one um, starting vertex. And with one multiplication, what I do find is the one half neighbors. And if I continued this and brought the, uh, the first half neighbors to the right hand side, deleted anything that was redundant and did it again, I would find two half neighbors. And as long as I keep my frontier sparse, and I'll get back to that later, this is a work efficient implementation of the standard top down, also known as push based um, breadth first search. It is also space efficient as long as you know um, the right sparse um, uh, data structures. In fact, um, it's, it's not a coincidence that if you ask someone what is the best static uh, representation of a graph these days, sparse graph, they will say compressed sparse rows. And that name should not surprise you because it is the name of a sparse matrix data structure, compressed sparse rows simply because it turns out that's the, that's the right thing to do there as well. But what's really striking here is not that it's equivalent because that would be boring, right? What is really interesting is the parallelism aspect for me. Now, with, with, with one primitive here, I'm able to capture three levels of parallelism, uh, which is the independent searches, the, all the uh, vertices in the frontier of any search, and all the outgoing edges of any of those vertices on the frontier. So there's three levels of parallelism in this operation, and this is nicely captured by the sparse matrix, sparse matrix multiply. In fact, when I implemented this thing 12 years ago, I had no idea that I was 
actually capturing these three levels of parallelism on the graph space. And it took another five, six years of the community to write, start writing papers about this. Um, if you want to find them, they're called like, you know, between a centrality and parallelism, you'll find the references because multiple source, thread first search is a primitive for uh, between a centrality, especially on undirected graphs. Now, um, here's another example. Let's say I want to coarsen my graph into a smaller graph where I define a set of aggregate vertices, meaning those vertices will form a super vertex in the next coarser level graph. And um, this is a primitive that is commonly used in multi-level algorithms such as um, algebraic multigrid, uh, graph partitioning, hypergraph partitioning, and in fact, some of the beautiful theoretical algorithms like Cogger's um, minimum cut algorithm. Now, all you need to do to get this right is to build an indicator matrix where each row tells you what vertices will be aggregated in the uh, coarser graph. Um, and this is as many rows as there are vertices in the coarser graph, and as many columns as there are vertices in the fine graph. And if you multiply that with the original adjacency matrix and the transpose of the um, indicator matrix, you will get the connections right. And the redistribution, if you're in a parallel environment, will be there nicely. Uh, without you paying attention. Now, all of this is, I am putting this in the lens of parallel computing because I, th these are all equivalences. You can actually write this thing pretty fast on a um, single node machine without using the linear algebra uh, abstraction. And there's no reason to believe that a linear algebra abstraction should give you any performance benefit for these problems on a single node, single machine problems. But it gives you, an ability to scale to distributed memory machines through the data parallelism um, and the primitives that allow you to not rewrite the same code. Now, um, having seen these developments um, taking place in uh, late 2000s, um, Tim Matson, who's on the call, decided, hey, I'm gonna get a bunch of people sign up to kickstart the process so different libraries do not end up um, getting slightly different functionalities and become unusable. And so he, he got a bunch of us to sign up on this one and a half page manifesto. Um, you can probably find a copy of this, but it's really nothing more than what the abstract is saying. It's our intention um, to build uh, an effort around this. And uh, you can find what we have done so far in the graph plus forum. The C API is particularly final. We're working on the C++ and distributed memory APIs. And there is a, pretty solid implementation of a single node um, version complete um, by uh, Tim Davis from Texas A&M. It is also multi-trading enabled. Um, lots of interesting optimizations that I would call that are enabled by the API. Uh, basically, um, in a nutshell, the API allows you to specify the data structure in an opaque way, meaning that the user doesn't actually know what data structure is used. So that allows the implementers to delay the updates, delay the deletions. And Tim, you know, uh, in a nerdy way, calls these zombies, for example, the deleted items that are um, not necessarily deleted from the data structure. And that kind of allows him to um, not update a static data structures in real time. Now, again, I want to go back and say that there's no reason to think that some um, linear algebraic abstraction should beat something that's really well optimized, like for example, LIGRA, right? Um, but that's really there for uh, large scale, uh, scalable parallels. So the SPIC, um, the language of Graph Plus or the API of Graph Plus looks like this. This is one example, one of my favorite examples. And I wanted to highlight a couple of aspects here. Why is this different from a standard Plus? Now, for those of you who haven't heard about the word Plus, it is, stands for basic linear algebra subroutines. And that's really the key that and it allows matrix multiply to go as fast as possible on your laptop, on your cell phone, on any machine you can buy these days because they have been vendor optimized and that has been our goal here as well. The hope that a standardization of graph plus will enable vendor optimized implementations. And so far we haven't gotten there, but Tim, Tim can tell you later, maybe there's some movement in the company side. So what's interesting in this um, signature is there's a concept of a mask and I'll give you an example about uh, it's used. 
and have it ties to the latest developments in graph processing. That masks tells the system there is certain items in the output I care, and there are certain out, uh, items in the output, when I say items, think of them as non-zeros, that I don't care. So you don't need to compute it. Even if the multiplication of A and B results in a non-zero in some particular location, if the mask says don't care, then that is not, not going to be written to the output. And that's probably the most important thing um, you might want to know here. There is also the semi-ring, which is what differs uh, GraphLaws API from a standard loss. Um, a semi-ring, in a nutshell, tells you what algebra the operation should be run on. And most of us already are familiar, everybody is familiar with the real field where we do numerical linear algebra. But then there is effectively infinite number of different algebras you can think about, some of which really apply uh, to graph algorithms. The most famous one is arguably the tropical semi-ring where you replace the additions with a minimum operation and the multiplication with the plus operation to compute shortest path. And uh, intuitively, one can think about the semi-ring addition as merging multiple paths and deciding which path to choose. Um, and the semi-ring scalar multiplication as concatenating different paths into a longer path. And once, we, once you've got that intuition, it's actually not much of a leap to go from um, what might be happening in shortest path versus what might be happening in, in a semi-ring matrix multiplier. And there's a couple of rules you have to follow, meaning that adds and multiplies needs to be associative and the multiply needs to distribute over addition, but those are actually satisfied in a surprisingly high number of different uh, semi-rings. In fact, uh, we are abusing the notion to the point that uh, as we can define semi-rings on different sets. The input output uh, sets can be different, which is not mathematically uh, well-defined, but it doesn't change the correctness. So I'm going to run you through a real example on, on the same seven vertex graph. This time I'm going to start with a single uh, source thread first search from vertex one. And to, to do that, I'm just going to multiply that with a column where only one non-zero exists in the first row. And it's marked with its index, let's say. This multiplication obviously finds the first up neighbors. Now let's, let's get a little, um, let's open a parenthesis and ask, what is the cost of this operation in general, right? This A transpose X, where X is a vector and it can have a bunch of sparse, um, a bunch of non-zeros, not just one in this example. Well, if that was dense, the X was dense, it would be the number of non-zeros in A, which would be the number of edges in the graph. However, X is sparse. So the cost is really the sum of the non-zeros in the columns of A for which there is a non-zero in the X. So the only the columns of A for which there's a corresponding non-zero in the X are fetched and merged. And overall iterations of bread for search, the total cost will sum up to the number of non-zeros because no non-zero in X appears twice in the input. And that is optimal for the conventional top-down bread for search. And, and the only reason I'm um, stating this se seemingly obvious fact is because there has been some people that think this is, um, and then Z, so the operation is doing D times uh, more work than, uh, than an optimal implementation would do, would do where D is the diameter. But that's not the case because we're using sparse data structures here. And in fact, if you wanna find a fast um, sparse matrix sparse vector code, I'm gonna put a shameless plug because this is my talk. And um, you can find this work and the code somewhere online linked from the papers where um, we were surprised to find that not paying attention to the matrix data structure is not enough. Normally we kind of ignore this vector um, as long as we respect the sparsity, but as the number of threads increase, we notice that that actually becomes a bottleneck. And there's, you can read the paper why it's a bottleneck and how, how we get around that. But this seems to be the fastest CPU code for this um, operation. Uh, I am not familiar with the GPU space on that. Um, you know, yeah, I'll tell you more. So let's continue with our bread first search. Now I'm gonna do the second iteration. I'm gonna, going to start um, with a frontier that represents the one half neighbors of one, which are two and four, and do another multiplication. So here are the interesting things to highlight. One is this um, 
the soccer ball like thing, which is on the first row. This is something, a vertex, that blindly multiplying A transpose X would find, but I am kind of canceling it out. Why? Because it's a back edge. It's a back edge to the vertex one that I started from. And how do I achieve that? I'll tell you in a minute, but it is the kind of non-zero that should not be generated. And there's a second thing that needs to be highlighted, which is uh, the fact that seven, vertex seven can be reached by both from vertex two and vertex four. So at that point, the semi addition semantics kick in and the, the system will make a decision. In this case, I want a deterministic red first search. So I put the minimum as uh, my semi addition, but I could have chosen anything because red first search doesn't care. And then I write it to the output, which is the parent array where I keep the parents of each visited vertex. And if you just look at the non-zero structure of parents, you can use that as the previously visited set of vertices. Now, um, now this looks like there's only one item that I previously visited, but as the algorithm proceeds, these will increase. As you can see that in the next iteration, um, all the edges that are outgoing from seven are effectively redundant traversals. And uh, they, were, they have been discovered and they've been marked in the parent survey and they do not need to be rediscovered. Now, when I first implemented um, this operation with MATLAB 15 years ago, there was no way to eliminate these redundancies. We would generate them with matrix vector product. They would be written to output and I would do an element-wise operation to get rid of them later. That's asymptotically not a big problem if you're only using top-down bread first search, the standard push base approach, but it was kind of constant factor expensive, both in terms of memory, um, data, memory, data movement, and um, mostly data movement. So, so that kind of brings us to this thing that I call output sparsity, um, which is the fact that anything that has been discovered previously do not need to be rediscovered. So the mask concept, I pushed the mask concept in graph plus with the thought that I didn't want these intermediate elements to be generated. And my vision initially was limited. And so was everybody's vision. And I, all I thought would, that could be accomplished was you would run the standard column-based matrix vector product. You would fetch certain columns, merge them, and check a mask to see if they have been previously discovered in real time. So you never generated those entries if the mask said they're there. Now that's kind of nice that it eliminates the memory traffic related to the output, but you still scan as many entries in the input as you would without the mask. So it doesn't save you in terms of real complexity, it just saves you some a memory traffic. It does have performance benefits, but nothing asymptotically exciting here. Um, the code looks nice though. If you want to see, um, we are in an effort to get rid of um, some of these boilerplates by moving to C++. Um, but if you ignore the boilerplate of having to write five lines to, to define one descriptor and replace them in your mind with constructors, you'll see that the actual breadth first search is a very tight loop. And all you're doing is matrix vector products with a mask. The mask is the previously discovered ones, the parents, and an application which keeps track of the levels um, of the vertices you visited. And if your output of breadth first search doesn't care about the levels, then you don't even need that line. A pretty pretty tight loop, but let's back. Let's go back to the um, push pull, which is the direction optimization. Um, some of you might know, but I'll describe. One of the biggest improvements that happened in the Graph 500 list was Scott Beamer, at the time a uh, grad student in Berkeley, discovered that as the algorithm proceeds, at some point, um, a lot of the vertices in the frontier were doing redundant edge examinations because there were less than 50% vertices left to be found. And the frontier was so large that if for each vertex to be found, there were seven or eight edge examinations happening and the majority of them were failing. They were either back edges to the things that were previously discovered. They were either redundant examinations, meaning that six, seven, um, edges were trying to discover the same child, if you think about the first search tree as a parent-child relationship, or they were side uh, edges to uh, within the frontier. And basically he said, well, I can switch to the point that 
undiscovered vertices try to look their incoming edges and see if they can find a back edge to the frontier. Now, that's, I believe, one of the uh, major aspects of LIGRA and its performance um, optimizations. It has a lot of other optimizations, but that's one of the things that LIGRA does for effectively almost every um, graph algorithm that it implements. And that has been very successful. And if almost every graph search has to implement this to be competitive these days. But I didn't, I didn't think this was possible in the language of linear algebra. So it was kind of disappointing um, to me at first. But then this, discussing this more and more with uh, my PhD student with John Owens, we came to realization that it is actually not that hard. So what is looking to incoming edges? It's just instead of doing column-based matrix vector product on the A transpose of the matrix, it's doing row-based because the rows of A transpose are the incoming edges. Now, you can't get a good performance out of this if you looked at all the incoming edges. That's effectively looking back from every vertex, not just the unvisited vertices. But then we had masks by then, at least conceptually. And it became very obvious um, how to do that with masks. Simply, uh, now the API changed our thinking. It says, well, then I'm going to look at the rows that are not masked out. And that's all I need to do. That is effectively looking back from the unvisited vertices. I already have the information from the API function. And just to illustrate what it looks like, you have this graph that I'm traversing on the right, uh, top right. And currently, I am my frontier is 0, 2, and 3. Um, the, the middle, um, the, the ones that are marked red at the bottom left. And of course, the unvisited vertices then are 4, 6, 7. And my next frontier would be 4, 7. So, so my mask will be the unvisited vertices. And those 4, 7, and 6 are only going to uh, look at their incoming edges, meaning the rows of that um, agency matrix transpose, and see if one of the edges hit the frontier. And that's all there is. And just to contrast what it looks like with the standard versus this one, you're traversing rows of the adjacency matrix, as you can see on the left, only for those rows where the items are not masked out, and see if you can hit the matrix input vectors. Uh, uh, you're doing intersection, simply, set intersection there. And the standard column-based math that you can still do, that's the push direction. Um, another terminology is people call this top-down uh, standard textbook graph traversal as push-based, and the version where uh, Scott Beamer called uh, bottom-up, where you, the unvisited vertices looking for incoming edges is the pull-based. And I, I think I found a term, terminology going back all the way to a, a paper co-authored by Dick Karp on network um, influence or something like that. I had cited it in one of these papers. So we. We wrote a paper about this, a short one, to describe that you can do this pull push efficiently in graph loss, thanks to masks. But it took Carl another um, year to implement this for a much larger set of primitives and make it um, uh, performant. And he called this graph blast. Um, so the main aspect of graph blast is it's a GPU code. It does direction optimization automatically, thanks to the mask masks. But it also takes advantage of the input sparsity to the vectors. Now, this was well known in the CPU world, but it's surprisingly the first paper that's been ever written by sparse matrix sparse vector uh, multiplication is, is one of Carl's earlier papers, before actually he and I started working together. So in some sense, I think there's more than a couple of um, optimizations going on here, uh, input sparsity, output sparsity, and GPU load balancing. And when we tested this in a um, standard set of benchmarks, you can find the GitHub repo by a quick um, Google. I don't think anything else comes up. Um, and another quick Google will tell you the archive link. Is, um, so let me show the result first. It, um, first of all, you have to take the Galois and Liger lines with a grain of salt because it's in a CPU and everything else is running on a GPU. Well, sweet sparse as well. So we're not really comparing the same hardware. However, there's no way to compare the same hardware. These are single um, node CPU codes, some of them, and some of them are GPU codes. But at least it gives you a sense of how things should fall. And in the GPU land, there's not much of a you know, um, 
benefit of using GPUs um, in the graph processing as much as there was um, when solving dense systems of uh, linear equations or doing dense matrix multiply. Um, and what you're going to see is any deviation from that line in the middle, the one line, if you're on the right, then it means graph blast is faster, meaning those these um, um, fully um, full circles. And any uh, hello circle means the competitor on that row is faster. And how much faster is really how far away from that middle line is. And this is log scale. So if you're far away a little bit, that's actually many, many factors. And you'll see a couple of things. One is um, the closest performance is to, to graph plus is Gunrock, which is probably not that surprising. It must be the implementing bias that, um, you know, coming from the same group and Davis, they must be sharing some of the optimizations. But that tells you there's not a lot of abstraction uh, penalty going on in there in terms of linear algebra. So that's good. And um, the other thing is we're significantly faster than switch sparse. And this is the multi-traded implementation of as of end of summer last year. It might have, both codes might have improved. So we don't, we don't continuously update this. Um, well, it's not a real-time benchmark. And in terms of other codes, I believe we are pretty good in page rank. We're very competitive in breadth first search. Um, in, in triangle counting, it really depends on the matrix. Sometimes we're much worse, sometimes we're much better. It's a little, we're almost never better than LIGO though, in terms of triangle counting. So there's some work we need to do there. And the code looks, like graph plus, except that it's C++ because um, graph plus doesn't have a C++ API. So we kind of emulated what would it look like. And the function names and signature orders are awfully the same, um, but the descriptions of objects are quite uh, liberal. We, we, uh, we decided on them quite liberally. Now that is um, the middle of my talk and it's a great time um, to ask questions. And I think I'm in the middle of time too, so it's not too bad. Oh, you can hey. put it on the ship. Yeah. Hey, Aiden. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about the triangle counting implementation. Um, does, does your implementation also use push-pull? I understand like a lot of them don't use push-pull. Yes, um, great question. The push-pull terminology on um, triangle counting is always a little uh, fuzzy to me because there is no frontier technically, but for the linear algebra, it's easier to think about. There's two ways to do it. One is you can, the linear algebra formulation that I haven't described is on the um, extra slides. And I don't know if I want it there. Maybe I'll just put it out there. Um, the way that um, this is implemented is simply a, a, a matrix multiplication of two uh, triangular uh, matrices. Now, actually, the one we use is the LL transpose, but doesn't matter. And those are going to enumerate all the wedges. And then if you do uh, an element-wise product with the original matrix, you see whether those edges are closing to form a triangle. So the push this direction, in my mind, would be to do the multiplication and check the, the closure of the wedges. And the pull direction would be you only um, pull the inner products of the, the non-zeros in A, meaning that you start with the closing edge and see if there is a open wedge that supports it. So that would, in my mind, will be a pull direction. So if um, in, with those put in as the pull and push definitions, yes, Graphalas does that based on yeah. the output. But really, which one will be faster really depends on the ratio of triangles to wedges. And it's really different on the graphs. Right. And uh, I think we have to uh, fine tune that decision because if your most of your if your clustering coefficient is is really high um, versus low, it's a very different decision about which algorithm to use because that clustering coefficient is effectively a proxy for the ratio of triangles to edges. Right. Okay. Do do you determine online like which version? No, you I don't. I don't think there is a smart decision process okay. going on there. <laughs> but I that's see. a good question. And um, we are in the process of revising the paper and that's one of my top priorities to okay. get Thanks. a better decision there. Um, there was another question about what, like, what, what the hardware configuration was for the 
experiments for like the different frameworks. Um, yeah, that's all in the papers. Um, I think we use a P100 and for the CPUs, we use a, a dual socket Xeon. Uh, but okay. which Xeon, <laughs> I wish Intel uh, was a little more discriminatory. Not, not an old Xeon, but um, you should um, take a look at the, um, the, the preprint and let us know if you think we're using a, a generation old machine. I mean, we're using a generation old GPU, so maybe that's not too bad. Um, okay. <laughs> maybe now we're using a two generational GPU uh, because I think the new release have happened a couple months ago. Yeah. Uh, okay. we, we'll be happy to, um, to update those things before the revision if you uh, reach us on that. Sure, so, thanks. I wanna talk a little bit about non, well, there's still graphs. So let's take a more modern uh, problem set, which is machine learning on graphs, where is this my first slide? No, kernel methods is my first slide. Uh, if you have ever taken a um, machine learning class, you might have heard about kernel methods. In a nutshell, it effectively maps your data space into a higher dimensional space. And the data that was not linearly separable suddenly becomes easier to separate in a higher dimensional space. And this is an excellent figure from Russell and Norvig's book that shows you for a real data set, how a particularly chosen kernel allows you to do that. Now, there are tricks um, that um, you have to play to make this competitive in the sense that you can apply the kernel trick to never form the elements in the high dimensional space, but still operate on them as if you're operating on the high dimensional space. And you can read about that if you don't know about it. But in the end, the kernel trick is used um, a lot in support vector machines, Gaussian process regression and a lot of other machine learning um, techniques. There's a couple of restrictions um, when you um, define similarity, which is, which is the kernel uh, itself, that it needs to be positive definite and has to obey a couple of other um, uh, rules. But you can think of it as defining similarity between objects, a kernel function. Um, now, how do we do that for graphs? And why would you do that for graphs? Let's, let's ask the first question. Why would I do that for graphs? It is, um, let's say I want to learn some molecular properties. And it's really expensive to run um, DFT, density functional theory calculations on, on molecules to precisely simulate what those um, properties would be. But we do know it for a lot of uh, molecules already. So why can't we use machine learning to say, if two molecules, their, their graph are similar, um, they should likely have the same molecular property, let's say atomization energy or toxicity or anything. For that, we have to define a, a similarity metric between two graphs. And one of the most commonly used ones is the random walk definition, where um, if random walks on these two graphs, simultaneous random walks, hit the same vertex at the same time more often, then that means they're more similar. And you can define this thing. Um, it's, it's, and, and in fact, it's much easier to think of this um, in the Kronecker product space where the, we define the product graph, which for two graphs, which N and M vertices each, the product graph would have N times M vertices and many, many edges um, defined using the graph product. And you would be just doing a single random walk. Uh, and that's, that's, that's much easier uh, to think about. And that's really boils down into computing the Kronecker product on these matrices that represent graph A, graph B, and, and that simulate random walks. Luckily, we don't need to run this random walk. There's a closed form approximation that is simply solving um, a linear equation on the pro uh, Kronecker product space. Um, and that's general enough that you can include all sorts of information about the graph, including the vertex labels, edge labels. Um, so why would I want to include them? Imagine you have atoms, you know, like um, hitting the same hydrogen uh, versus a different atom at the same time, tells you something different, gives you a different signal, whether the similarity is high or low, right? So the labels are actually quite inform uh, informative there. And this formulation allows you to do that. But just to get to the high performance computing side of this, it really is solving a system of linear equations on 
that's defined on the product space of two sparse matrices. This is the conical product. And we want to uh, solve it with a, a preconditioned uh, conjugate gradient method, which is the standard method to solve it. So it would be silly to form the Kronecker product and then, um, and then do the matrix vector multiply, which is the workhorse of conjugate gradient. Instead, uh, what we're doing here is we would be just streaming to the entries of the, the first graph in tiles. And then for each tile in the first graph, I'm going to do a Kronecker product uh, multiplication with the tile on the other graph, immediately do uh, matrix vector product on that temporary uh, uh, matrix, Kronecker product matrix, and delete it. So this way, I'm not maybe saving uh, flops, but I'm saving a lot of space that will be required to form the Kronecker product. And it does uh, matter to a degree that um, if you're talking about uh, factors of a hundred difference because you wouldn't ever need to touch uh, the, 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 the global memory of the GPU. In fact, you would probably have a hard time fitting this thing. Now imagine you have two graphs and not that big ones. You can have 10,000 uh, non zeros each, just um, your Kronecker product would have um, 10 to the eight uh, non zeros. And that's already becoming a problem for a GPU. And for bigger graphs, you're in um, deeper problems. And then we did, of course, a lot of more uh, optimizations that we like to do, including uh, taking advantage of sparsity because these tiles, if they're completely empty, then I can just jump over them and not touch them. Um, and for those, we use specialized graph partitioning routines. And that's actually a nice thing that I wanna, wanted to talk more, but I don't have time. It simply is the fact that you can run graph partitioning on these graphs independently, which are really small, and save time on an operation that is whose cost is on the order of the product of them. So now the questions about whether graph partitioning pays off or not are redundant because it's run on a really small uh, space, which are the individual graphs itself. And um, if, if we can't get a completely empty tile, what we can do is we can simply encode it in, in a sparse way, but keep a bitmap of all the non-zeros in there so that right before we do operate on them, we can expand it into a dense representation on the registers of the GPU without, um, and then do the dense uh, chronicle product, which is much faster to do than the sparse one. But we won't be paying the memory transfer of these zero entries because we only stream the sparse entries and expand into a dense representation on the registers in real time. So there's quite a lot of good stuff that went into that. And you can um, read or watch this video. Um, if you, um, I'm gonna give you a link at the end of the talk where we decided that we should put some of the videos of the conferences that were canceled or, or maybe quote unquote made online, but effectively canceled um, on our own um, website. And there's, a, there's an 18 minute video of you, Hank, talking about this work, much more detailed than I can talk and in much, um, much more knowledgeable on the topic himself, the first author. But in the end, you can go and compute graph kernels uh, on the whole protein database in less than three minutes. Whereas the competitor software, of course, unfair uh, maybe, but because they are using Python, um, but uh, you're comparing months to, to, to three minutes. So it's quite a bit of difference uh, in this problem. So the, the relevance to this operation is effectively we're doing sparse matrix computations and you can write down this graph kernel thing exclusively in, in graph plus. We have Kronecker product, we have the matrix vector product. So that's a, we didn't do that because this is a GPU code and um, some of the optimizations that are required to do this tile by tile, there is no runtime yet for graph plus, but we're working on having a runtime that would generate competitive code uh, as much as, uh, as, as competitive as the one you hang hand, handwritten. So now I'm gonna move a little bit to the uh, biology space, um, but still staying uh, somewhat close to graphs and machine learning. It is, it is a very um, popular algorithm called Markov cluster algorithm that is um, exclusively 
uh, that's almost the de facto algorithm for clustering proteins. And you can actually uh, see the logic of the algorithm pretty easily. It does random walks from every vertex in the graph. And of course, the, that's really pushing probabilities to neighbors. And if you're inside a densely, cluster, uh, densely connected cluster, the probability mass gets trapped within the cluster. Um, and then it will be very easy to uh, figure out what the clusters were. Now, the problem with that naively is if you just keep pushing mass in a random walk, this thing will quickly get denser because your probability to mass will go everywhere. Instead, um, what Marco cluster algorithm does is after each probability to push, what they call expansion, it also um, inflates the values. And inflation is simply uh, looking at all the connected. Um, edges to every vertex and then taking them to a certain power and then renormalize. Now, if you have, imagine you have two edges outgoing and what point 0.9 and point 0.1, if I square each one of them, point 0.1 and point 0.9, and renormalize the sum to one, the one that was smaller by a factor of nine will be now smaller by a factor of much more. So then they will become like small enough that I can prune them. And then it does this pruning and continues so that it maintains sparsity. And if you look at the pictures, it actually is a, is a real clustering of a real graph, where it first gets a little denser because of these expansions, but then thanks to these inflation and pruning, it maintains sparsity after um, the co first couple of iterations. And this is of course different in every graph, what iteration it will start converging. And in the end, you can just run a fast connected components algorithm to get the clusters themselves. Now, this is a very expensive algorithm, and many people try to do um, shortcuts to this thing. And my experience from real biologists is they test those algorithms and they say it doesn't work because finding protein clusters is really tricky problem where you're trying to find families of proteins that share an ancestor. And the signal between them gets weaker as generations pass. So this algorithm is really nice mining them because you can actually find five, six, seven layers of um, uh, you know, uh, evolutionary distance by just um, uh, doing this flow-based uh, random walk. And a lot of the other algorithms that are density-based will not be able to find those uh, families of proteins. So that's the protein, uh, sorry, that's the um, biology parentheses. Let me go back to the parallel computing um, space where obviously this picture, this random walk um, tells you that from every vertex, you can just implement this with the same primitive that I've been talking about in the beginning of the talk, which is multiplying two sparse matrices. If I just square the matrix, then every vertex has taken one um, step of the random walk. Now that's naively uh, what we first tried, but just a quick estimation tells you that even before we attempt any inflation and pruning, we would run out of memory on the largest supercomputer that was available to us at all. So we imagine you have a vertex with a graph with 100 million vertices. You would think that's not large, but it has a um, 1,000 plus um, degree, average degree. And if you square this thing, if you're lucky, you'll get a million degree, and that's very dense. And if you're unlucky, meaning you have a skewed degree distribution, you'll get even more non-zeros. So we couldn't form the eight A square at all. Instead, as a simple solution is to form it in batches of B. And that's a nice abstraction because um, the decisions to inflate and prune um, is simply done in a per vertex way. Meaning I don't need to know the global matrix to do that. So I can just form a subset of the columns on the output, prune them, inflate them, and save space and move to the next batch. Um, and that's exactly what the HIPMCL does. And it chooses the number of uh, phases, the number of batches automatically. The larger, the better in terms of parallelism and communication costs. But if you have no memory, it will not crash. It will just continue moving. Um, and we published this thing in a uh, biology journal. And it seems to have users that according to um, when I look at the citations, I see something different. When, when a 
parallel computing researcher cites us, it's either to say that, hey, we beat them in performance, or yeah, yeah, they exist as well. Here, it's a little different. They say, hey, we used FMCL to generate these clusters, and here's the science result we found. It find, it, I find it more gratifying, surprising, maybe not surprising. And these numbers are a little old, but just to give you a glimpse, um, this, these are gonna be useful. These numbers are old, but I'm gonna show you how they improved. And so this, this is a computation that takes hours on one fourth of Cori, which at the time was a top five machine when we ran these things three years ago, uh, top five machine on earth. Now you can see the issues there. Like when you run for so long on so many nodes, something can go wrong. So, um, and that's what was a little bit of a painful process to get these numbers. And the architecture seemed to be moving in a direction that's away from these homogeneous machines where the supercomputers are now having acceler accelerators. And I'm sure you all know about this thing. So we have taken the step to move uh, HIPMCL uh, into supercomputers with accelerators, including the machines like Summit or Perlmutter we're gonna get at NERSC they are gonna all have GPUs attached to them. So the challenge here was how to utilize all the GPUs and how to hide the communication. And it doesn't actually take a lot of um, uh, novel techniques here, but you can do something called, uh, also known as pipelining or high overlapping communication with communication, where you overlap the internode communication with the time that it takes to move the data to the GPUs and then effectively only one of them is left um, in, in your total runtime. And we did a lot of those optimizations and luckily the sparse matrix matrix multiply kernel we're using for this operation now has seven libraries that support it. Four of which are open source, three of them are render supplied. Um, NVIDIA supplies two. This is kind of surprising. Actually NVIDIA supplies three uh, and they have their competing libraries. Um, so that was a really nice surprise. And I attribute it to the success of GraphLAS because uh, five years ago when I looked, I would find if I'm lucky, maybe one implementation. And the fact that now there is um, seven of them, it means that these uh, functions are getting popular enough that people work on them and improve on their uh, quality every year. So when putting these fast GPU um, uh, sparse matrix matrix multiply, with um, pipelining and several other optimizations like memory estimation and eager binary merging, we're able to get um, 12 times faster than a run that doesn't use the GPUs. Now, of course, you might say this is silly. Why would you not use GPUs on a machine that has GPUs? But that was the state of the code when we started. There was no uh, GPU support. So at the moment, we're no longer wasting a supercomputer. And similar to the previous work, you can find the video of this um, as well on, on our YouTube page. And the paper also appeared um, in our PDPS. I'm noticing that um, I might have maybe five minutes. So luckily I'm in my last piece of uh, the puzzle, which um, is completely biology, where we're thinking of how to assemble genomes, DNA sequences, uh, come from the sequencer is a quote unquote short read, meaning your genome is three gigabase pairs, 3.5 gigabase pairs, but the longest read you'll probably get to today is 25,000 base pairs. So there is, um, I don't know how many orders of magnitude difference, you, you can do the math. There's maybe five orders of magnitude of difference. Um, so you have to put these, um, reads um, or sequences uh, in, in, as if they're a puzzle together to form the final final genome assembly. Now, we call these actually long reads, even though they're like 15 to 20,000 base pairs, because before then we were dealing with 150 base pairs. So this is already a great advancement. And the common way to use is overlap consensus uh, paradigm. Simply, you need to find the overlaps between these reads before you start doing anything clever about this. And that's usually the most time consuming part of the genome assembly. And, and here's, here's how, we, how people do that. Usually they look at something called the k -mer. Of course, 
they can't compare every single read to every single read because it's a it's a quadratic computation in the number of reads and there are many reads you can divide 3.5 gigabase pairs to to 15000 and you'll see I'm in a read pair not only that each comparison is quadratic in the length of the reads which is a dynamic programming so that gets quickly really high instead what they do is they use an index structure which is uh, called kmersh um, subsequence of length k and they build an index based on these kmers um, and then when they look at the, the read, they say, okay, does this the kmer in this read exist any other uh, read? And then that's used as a filter on the comparisons you need to do. And that can actually cut this down to almost linear time with a high constant. And we're not going to deviate from that approach. How we chose kmers is very specific, but at the end of the day, assume that there is a process to choose kmers from the read. And then you can build this thing called a read by camera matrix once you count the cameras and selected them. And what it tells you is a non zero in this matrix is um, it signifies the presence of that camera in that read. Very simple. You can now encode all sorts of information there, including like what position that camera exists in the read. And you can read the details in, in this paper um, that I referenced here. Um, this is all recorded and I'll share the slides happily with anyone who's interested. Well, if I multiply this reads by camera matrix with its transpose on a very obscure, I'm going to call it semi-ring that I defined, it's actually not that obscure, it's very simple, um, that keeps track of the shared cameras, just keeps adding the shared cameras, then I automatically found all the read to read overlaps. And that's basically the, the power of um, just using sparse linear algebra on semi-rings because I can abuse the, the semi-ring definition. I can just write, use the same code that is, has been optimized for a decade to do read overlapping. Instead, to the point that now Bella used to be um, like a significant portion of the runtime was uh, overlapping. Nowadays, it's so, you know, 1%, 2% that we don't care about uh, how sparse matrix, matrix multiply performs in this case because it is no longer a bottleneck. Now, this has been extended by a couple of groups. Uh, Torsten Heffler and Edgar Solomonic, um, and, these are, um, and their students wrote the papers where they use sparse matrix multiply to find similarities between metagenomes, two whole metagenomes. In their case, they're multiplying two sparse matrices, again, the camera by read matrix to find Jeckard similarity. Um, but the output is, um, is dense in their case because whole metagenomes, there are not many of them. And almost every pair of whole metagenomes has some signal between them, unlike our case, where the output is, in our case, is sparse. And you can read their paper. It was also in IPDPS, and it was able to scale to you know, tens of thousands of uh, processes, which is the beauty of using the sparse uh, matrix abstraction. Uh, they were able to use a uh, Cyclops tensor framework um, and the uh, arbitrary semi support of it to make the scale to large um, processor count. With that, I think I went over um, applications of sparse matrices and some of the, the algorithms behind them for graphs, machine learning and biology, and hopefully, uh, some of you are interested in um, those problems and the power of sparse matrices. And you can um, read um, more about this on my research team's website at passion.lbl. And thank you for your attention and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks, Aiden, for the talk. Um, are there any questions 